Greetings and salutations, all you truly beautiful individuals. It's another rep of the gun lock. Eric and Mark here with you to look back at the good times, the good, even though there's sometimes the bad. We're looking at the best organizations in the history of League of Legends. And the criteria here, yes, heavy implications on on the rift successes, achievements, accolades, but we're also taking into account what the outside perception of the organization is, the history of how they treat their players and staff, and just how well run as a whole these teams are. It's taking that, you know, statistical numbers, all these trophies, all these accolades and everything else, and then adding them on in to things that can contribute off the rift, on rift, off rift, all these type of things behind the scenes type of situation that you're looking at with these organizations and It'll paint a pretty clear picture that we've got not uh, not very many orgs that are very uh, clean in their record sheet when you're talking about everything all considered into it. But we do have two wonderful standout organizations to look at and, of course, some fantastic ones still leading behind them, even if not spotless in their record. Yeah, I don't think anyone's immune to some varying degrees of controversy within the orgs, but we're going to get rid of the drama right away and go for the top org and much like these lists you can probably guess who it's going to be when you look at achievements as an organization and how they treat their players who wants to be playing there of course t1 is at the very forefront of this you could honestly break this up into t1 and skt and they might be number one number two orgs all time yes this is the dominant organization within league of legends t1 esports coming on through and you said it skt t1 both of them could be occupying this type of top tier when we're examining the best organizations of all time of course with the multiple the numerous world championships msi domestic championships you go through that trophy cabinet you're not going to find a better one in this sport than what t1 can offer with their history of a success and championships the other thing of course is to look at how they've involved with their players and their interactions with them a lot of the times guys staying within that t1 ecosystem whether that's all the way through their careers or at the end of their careers wanting to come back sign in for you know content creation whatever type of situation t1 has been very good about that very few uh, incidences to go through on this one and i think most of them actually Go to the fan base, not actually part of the organization would be where you would be trying to put a red X on the T1 history. Yeah, I mean, that absolutely is the most toxic is how the fans are showing up uh, with trucks. But yeah, obviously the prestige, this is where players want to play when they're young. It helps that they win all the time. That's the main reason. But again, it's the player support, developing these young players. The core of this uh, ZOFGK has been players that they grew from their own talent system and then as you mentioned you look at guys like wolf antara easy hoon at one point bang just staying associated with the organization after they've retired or gone to other teams and then come back bangy tom pumandu more recently mata all these former guys have also been parts of coaching staffs t1 looks after their own even when their playing days are behind them. And then, I mean, other examples of the greatness of this org is when Guma took Teddy's spot, they weren't forcing a buyout. They let Teddy find an opportunity that he could because they just loved what he brought. And Reckless coming in as a guy who doesn't speak Korean and is only playing on the challenger scene, you heard him talk about how much T1 was doing to make sure that he was able to be at his very best. And I think one of the other things that has to be taken into account for this with T1 is how they engage with their fan base, how they cultivate this cult of T1 that has come through, especially with the most recent roster that we that have been with this organization, building up that type of fan base, the way that they create the content for them to interact with, the opportunities, the different fan. You know, you had the T1 homecoming type of event, which, of course, spoiled by KT Rolster. Got to mention that one. Uh, you know, Red Bull League of their own playing in, and being involved in that type of one. I don't think there's any team that tries to make the effort to give extra to their fans, whether that is with performances, behind the scenes looks, uh, you know, apparel, all these type of things 
T1 has got to be that leading at the very forefront. And that extra effort that they put into it is why, one of the reasons why, this fan base has ballooned to bigger than every other organization combined, basically at this point. But there's no surprise or secret that the second best, most successful organization is the main rivals to T1 when you are talking about Gen G. And of course, this goes even further back to the Samsung era before they had a little... KSV split era that no one remembers before Genji took that over but when you bridge those two eras together well then you're talking about a world championship under the belt obviously a plethora of LCK titles and that combined with like how T1 looks after their own guys like Ambition and Cuve have been associated with the organization long after they retired. I know everybody seems to think that being called little brother is a bad thing. Well, let me just tell you, as a little brother, uh, you know, it's not always the bad side of a situation. Sometimes you get the positives of having that example before you. And for an organization like Gen G, yes, they might be the little brother. Yes, that trophy cabinet is little in comparison to an organization with dominant dynasties like SKT and T1. But it absolutely has helped them develop and blossom into one of the greatest organizations of all time and the second greatest on our list right here. It doesn't matter the era of it. You can go back through the Samsung eras and whether that was talking about Samsung White, Samsung Blue. And they're one of those teams. You can throw a lot of positives into that situation for it. And then you get to the KSV era, which will kind of just sweep under the rug. Nobody pays attention to that one because nothing... Nothing all that significant really ended up happening at that point, but you get the rebrand to Gen G. We keep the black and gold color scheme and things are going pretty well. And yes, you start to bring back some of these old players, involve them into the fold of the organization, start bringing in other members of the LCKs, uh, you know, Hall of Fame type of situation, bringing in score as a coach, these type of things. And then the success on the rift in the LCK, uh, you know, you talk about T1 and the great things with them. We've not had a dominant domestic stretch the way that uh, this Gen G organization has been able to roll through in recent years. And I think one of the biggest testaments to being a rock solid organization, and you'll see it throughout this list, is having one or multiple members who are there for the long haul. They're not leaving this organization, even if the roster might shift around them, because they know this is the best opportunity. Faker's the obvious one for T1. Genji, ruler, is the next man up. And then, case in point, you see, he says, I'm only coming back to the LCK after his LPL stint if I'm going to be back on Gen G because that's the only organization I want to play for. And I think one of the things that you can look at as well, again, is that leadership at the very top. Again, part of that with T1 is Joe Marsh and the, and the role that he has played in the success and the building of the current dynasty for T1. You can look at the same with Gen G. You can look at Arnold and what he has done, his commitment to this team, to excellency, and as well to caring for the players. That has been a big part of it. It's one of these things where it seems to be, oh, it's got to be one or the other. You can either be soft and care about these players and emotions and everything else, or you can be a brute force and, oh, it's only success and take the championship. There's a path where both succeed, and you find that harmony, and that is one of the things that both T1 and Gen G at the very top as our best two organizations of all time absolutely share and their leaders at the top are a big reason why. Definitely doing heavy lifting when it comes to holding the brand that is the LCK are these top two organizations that we're talking about. Heavy lifting being done for the entire Western scene when you're talking about G2 Esports who haven't been around as long as Samsung or T1 but Ever since 2016, when they splashed on the scene and were winning these LEC titles with the young rookie in perks at the time, they have been far and away the most dominant team in the LEC. Maybe the most dominant domestic major region team that we've had over that entire stretch. And you can include T1 or Gen G in that conversation because since like 2016, I think it's only been two years that haven't had a title under the G2 belt. I was going to say, you can pretty much look at Detonation Focus Me and, and Movistar R7 as the only organizations to have anywhere close to the domestic success that G2 has been able to have. Yes, of course, 
uh, the way the whole the LEC season splits, all these things work out. It's kind of exploded a little bit, but being above 16 domestic titles, more than 16 is that rarefied air that G2 find themselves in. And yes, they are that leading charge, that tip of the spear of Europe. So much to talk about in the history of this organization. The trophy cabinet plays a part into this one. Yes, it's not the same as a Gen G, not the same as a T1 missing that world championship, but it still comes through and shows the class and the dominance that this organization has been able to show and the presence that they have been able to maintain at that international top level. And, you know, outside of success domestically, success internationally, one of the best content teams of any of them, you know, all the specialty, whatever, even if it's a sponsored thing with Polo, Ralph Lauren, Spotify, whatever, the ingenious that goes into the personalities, because let's face it, they've had many personalities over the year, but all the content stuff that G2 putting up always s tier when it comes to these organizations but that's not to say there haven't been some hiccups bumps in the road for g2 obviously how things ended up playing with ocelot when he stepped away uh, was no longer ceo for the squad and then of course perks not allowed to go to fanatic his rough buyout reckless not allowed to go back to fanatic there was definitely some contract jailing that has gone on in g2's history you can add our, our boy Yankos to that list as yep. well, experiencing some of these poison pilled contracts from G2. And that's where you kind of get one, you know, one of these red X's put onto your report card in this situation in a way that you don't have when you're looking at that very top of this list with T1, with the Gen G, where you have these situations where it might be the organization trying to maximize, trying to you know power brute force their way into being that ultimate position not taking care of the players, not taking care of the ecosystem, these type of things. You do get a little bit of that knock on it. I did want to return to talking about the content creation part of G2 and, and their engagement with fans as much as I talk about that, of course, with T1 and Gen G is still not that far behind them. G2 is somewhere into that type of territory, I would say, alongside of T1 and how they cater to their fan base and create these type of moments, these opportunities for them. And I also think another part of that shout out is due to Mr. Romain on the squad as well and how he hypes up and gets involved with that fan base and bringing that European pride to the rim. And Romain with that entire support staff, G2, absolutely one of the best in the business. You know, it's always a full room backstage during these big events because there's so many behind the scenes staff supporting the players and that coaching staff. First LPL squad to get in here. This is the iconic OG gods that were winning everything in the early days of the LPL. That is Edward Gaming, EDG. Obviously, the last couple of years haven't quite been as relevant, but, you know, the Clear Love era from 2014, basically straight through to winning that coveted world championship in 2021. This was the premier LPL team pretty much throughout that entire stretch. They were a top three squad in the region. EDG. What a fun one to talk about here from the LPL. You have to go a couple of early years to try and establish what type of power team is and why they can put themselves into a list and a category for the greatest organizations of all time. You're going back to 2014, 2017, some pretty good years, special years where they are, of course, the Chinese esports team of the year, getting that award of, uh, you know, just as it is type of thing but making sure that they are that's where they built that type of legacy in the early eras of the game of league of legends and then finally paying it all off for their diehard supporters for that fan base that has been built up with that 2021 world championship and again not without a little bit of drama behind the scenes. Sometimes it's more to do with players. Obviously, the whole lawsuit against Scout did not look good, almost denying him a spot at Worlds. But I think EDG weren't fully the bad guys. I mean, obviously, suing your former player isn't a great look. Uh, but who knows? T1 might be going down that path uh, in the future. I think Scout did maybe do his contract a little bit dirty. So it's like it's half an X for EDG for that one. Yes, the, I don't think it's uh, it's not as maybe egregious as G2 in the poison pill type of contract situation, but I don't think that EDG is necessarily backing it up the same way G2 is with the other successes, with the other factors that they're able to bolster themselves into that third type of position. EDG 
finding themselves here. As far as the LPL organizations go, that's about as clean a sheet as you're going to find when you're going through some of these teams and some of the histories that they have had. So for EDG, again, Edward Gaming, very happy to have them on a list like this. It has been a long time, long established history to build themselves into this type of position as one of the greatest organizations of all time. The final major region to get some squads on this list when you're talking North America. If you did this five years ago, TSM's probably the easy squad to be putting on here, but I can tell you they're not sniffing anywhere near this list in the modern times. It's got to be Cloud9 as that first organization that you're talking about. Internationally, so often the last hope for the LCS has picked up so many domestic titles. And just talk about the buff for guys like Sven Skarin and Sven, who looked like they were washed and their careers were done, and then they get MVP-level performances when they show up on Cloud9. Until 2024, Cloud9 had been in at least one of the season finals for the LCS all the way through. Hadn't missed playoffs in a year in one of those situations either until 2024. That's like a 10-year stretch, by the way decade long success for this organization 2018 the esports organization of the year getting a little bit of a acknowledgement there got to fill out our lcs trophy cabinets with a couple of other these other trophies because we're not bringing up the world championships the same way that the lck and even edg is able to stock up into theirs but semi-final Cloud9, though that's that's basically a title for an lcs team <laughs> as far as lcs teams go the international track record for cloud nine is one of if not the best track record that you could be looking at so they do get a little bit of a acknowledgement in that one but i think as far as looking at domestically how they've been able to succeed the type of fans that they've been able to generate with of course the early eras of league of legends with you know the you know lemonation hall of balls high you know medio sneaky rolling through these guys all the way through then you of course then you added jensen rush the memer squad and how things went and then the current era of success that we have with cloud nine this is one of the best organizations again you look at the top you look at the leadership Jack has been a big part of that one, the way that he has led. Not all of his decisions are ones that I think I've agreed with personally, and I think the community would feel the exact same way in some of the reasoning for it, but absolutely one that has been willing to stick his head on the chopping block with all of the decisions, everything else. He's taking that type of uh, you know credit, that type of blame in these situations, and I think that type of leadership is something that is necessary to be one of these greatest organizations of all time. Yeah, there's at least accountability in that uh, staff upper management that we've had in Cloud9. Even though there's been some dicey benching Sneaky, benching Jensen, firing LS right away. Again, there's still been some X's with the organization. Uh, the, the LS one is, is the worst one for me. I know there still is a lot of, you know, he said, they said type of stuff behind the curtain. All these types of things in that situation where I don't think anyone other than the parties involved are truly going to ever know the full thing. That one does rub me the wrong way and is one of these ones that does knock Cloud9 down a peg or two. And honestly, there's probably less blemishes on the number six squad here when you're talking about Team Liquid, even though there's not the international success. That's kind of partially why Cloud9 is ahead. But we know TL looks after their own. We know Broxa, Bwipo, other guys have been uh, involved in the team even when they stop playing, either streaming under the banner or being part of their absolutely insane Alienware facilities. And there's a reason all these imports like Hansama, Piosik, Core JJ originally, they want to play for Team Liquid because it is the premier org in North America. And I think it's an incredible story of, of growth when you look at an organization like Team Liquid, because you can go back to so many of the early areas, the foundational years of this organization, and you never would have seen them being on a list like this down the road, talking about the greatest organizations of all time and what they have been able to do. Of course, I think a large part of that starts with Double Lip coming over the, to the, the team and the success that they were able to build there that was where they decided that is the identity that we need to establish this is the team liquid that we need to be for the future and they were able to build towards that adding in uh, a world champion and core jj to that bottom lane and has been there ever since as captain america down there being one of those leading pillars again 
You look at the leadership, Steve, another one that has been involved, one that does operate and, you know, does his business, the, the you know, usually the right, the proper way, the honest type of way to do business. This is Team Liquid. I think one of the ones that you can knock on them a little bit is maybe, you know, looking at their commitment to the North American development of talent over the last couple of years. But still, even one like that gets watered down a little bit when you're talking about what type of negative effect that has on this organization. When you're looking at young players like APA and Jan, that they have been nurturing and developing up through the North American scene. And yeah, I think that is something both Cloud9 and TL have done at times very well. Of course, have spent money importing free agents as well, but have had good development systems at one point. If you're looking next squads up that aren't quite on this list, I think the main four you got to talk about are IG, RNG, Fnatic, and D plus Kia. And for me, D plus is probably the close to getting back onto this list because the other three have some bigger X's, especially we're talking about, you know, RNG and Fnatic contract jailing literally the two goats of their organizations in Uzi and Reckless. Oh, it feels bad because it's it's one of these ones where it should be an absolute shoe in It should be a layup for both RNG and Fnatic to find themselves on this type of list. The history, the runway room, all the successes, the great moments, these type of things that they have built for them, that's all there. And then they're just taking a cannonball, one after the other, <laughs> just shooting it down and knocking down the castle that they've built with those poor choices would be the way to look at it for both of those organizations. I think another one would be IG, not necessarily in the same type of way as, you know, RNG and their, their contract jailing type of situation, but not necessarily experiencing the same dominance, the same type of success to that type of way, capitalizing on their world championship victory. And then the years afterwards, how it tailored off. I think that is where you find them not having enough steam power to climb up further on this list. And then for another one, D+, plus. this is one where you just need more time. I feel like more time and maybe teams like Gen G and T1 to slow down and to maybe step away from the very top of the LCK because other than that, D+, plus has been pretty spotless. If you're loyal to your players, your players are going to be loyal to the organization. That's what we learned on this list. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.